Society paints a vivid picture of the Old West, with rugged cowboys roaming the untamed frontier, guns holstered on both hips. Yet seldom do we ponder the intimate aspects of life in the American West. This lack of curiosity might find its roots in the scarcity of Wild West tales about romantic encounters. Even during a time when brothels dotted nearly every town and city, discussions about bedroom preferences remained hushed. This reticence owes, in part, to the puritanical values of American settlers, not to mention concerns about hygiene and medical care. Nevertheless, despite the taboo nature of the topic, a handful of intriguing anecdotes about romantic liaisons in the Old West have survived. The oldest profession thrived one thing stands out clearly about the Old West. The presence of sex workers was a fixture in any town or city. What surprises many is the diversity of these establishments across the West. Some places adhered more closely to the stereotypical image of these workers, while others held them in higher esteem, providing spacious and opulent settings for their trade. This profession also mirrored the socioeconomic strata of Old West society. The majority of these workers were young, typically under 30, often lacking formal education and, in many cases, unable to read or write. Some hailed from immigrant backgrounds, and pricing wasn't solely based on appearance, but also on nationality and ethnicity. Like the nameless and readily replaceable miners and railroad laborers of the American frontier, sex workers fulfilled a social and economic role necessitated by capitalism, but remained largely invisible and forgotten as individuals. Fluid gender roles and acceptance of homosexuality. When conjuring images of the Old West, one might envision tough, masculine men embodying stereotypical ruggedness. A cowboy heroically riding his horse to rescue a distressed damsel tied to railroad tracks, perhaps. Spitting tobacco, handling firearms, and partaking in strong drink. Yet, the reality of how cowboys viewed homosexuality might shatter these notions. Wild West society didn't neatly categorize individuals as homosexual or heterosexual. Rather, it allowed each person to embrace their authentic self in any given moment. According to an interview with Peter Bogue, chairman of the History Department at the University of Colorado at Boulder and author of Same Sex Affairs, people who engaged in same-sex activities weren't automatically labeled as homosexual, in communities with a shortage of women, like a mining camp populated mainly by men, some individuals would adopt both the roles of women for both physical and domestic companionship, defying traditional gender norms. In essence, in the Old West, folks found love and connection where they could. Birth control involved ingesting poisons. In an era marked by a carefree spirit, you might ponder why folks weren't welcoming bundles of joy more often. While condoms were indeed available, they fetched quite a price. Consequently, many folks turned to concoctions to put an end to unwanted pregnancies. These mixtures often contained poisonous elements frequently sourced from plants, capable of terminating an unwanted pregnancy. For women involved in such endeavors, pregnancy posed a significant threat. It could not only halt their livelihoods, but also jeopardize their lives. In truth, many women on the frontier met their demise during childbirth. Faced with such grim options, women often had to choose between pregnancies that could prove fatal or ingesting perilous substances to terminate them. Privacy. During intimate moments. Think again. In the Wild West, it was commonplace for families to reside in modest abodes, typically consisting of a single, spacious room. Naturally, when every family member shared a solitary space, privacy became a scarce commodity. This raises a legitimate query. How did couples find moments of intimacy while sharing a bed with children or other kin? Delving into the evolution of privacy and the shift toward regarding adult intimacy as a personal matter in Europe, author Brian Watson elucidated that during the Reformation, figures such as Martin Luther ushered in a sense of sanctity surrounding private intimacy, a concept previously foreign. 
In the United States, this kind of privacy was often a privilege of the affluent. Money equated to seclusion, a luxury beyond the reach of most denizens of the Wild West. Cross-dressing knew no boundaries. In his exploration of the Old West, historian Peter Bogue encountered a surprising prevalence of cross-dressing. Women frequently adopted men's attire to advance themselves and gain privileges denied to their gender during that era. However, men also partook in this practice. During a discourse on matters of sexuality and gender in the American West at the University of Wyoming, Boag remarked, What took me aback as I delved into these accounts of women dressing as men was the simultaneous discovery of numerous tales featuring men who dressed as women. Some things were too risque for cowboys. In the pages of the book, Slumming Sexual and Racial Encounters in American Nightlife, 1885-1940, penned by Chad Heap, Associate Professor of American Studies and Undergraduate Advisor of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program at George Washington University, it's expounded that oral pleasures were deemed a bit too exotic for the sensibilities of Americans during that era and thus were not commonly practiced. There's evidence suggesting that even individuals involved in the profession of intimate services disapproved of such activities and ostracized those who didn't mind engaging in them. The slang was vastly different than today's vernacular. In the days of the Old West, a completely distinct vocabulary was employed when discussing matters of passion. You can peruse a roster of Wild West slang right here. Among the more peculiar terms on the list, pie rooting signified intimate relations. Assault was rampant. A deeply somber and undeniable reality of the Old West was the limited choices available to women. Women occupied a distinctly secondary social position compared to men, fostering a climate of pervasive sexual assault. Survivors had scant, if any, avenues for seeking justice. According to Nancy Williams, an author and crisis worker focused on women's issues, in the last 150 years, we've gone from the steam engine to the jet engine, from horses to Lear jets, and from outhouses to gold-plated indoor plumbing. Yet, the progress women have made in defending against sexual assault really hasn't matched the pace of technology. There wasn't much education on the topic. Education regarding matters of intimacy was virtually non-existent. This means that not only were people inadequately informed about their own bodies, but they also lacked knowledge about sexually transmitted infections. In the late 1800s, pamphlets referred to as marriage manuals did exist to provide some information. However, these materials, aside from being often inaccurate, emphasized that engaging in such activities was acceptable only within the confines of marriage. They also propagated the idea that self-pleasure was unhealthy because any use of a man's seed for purposes other than procreation was deemed sinful in the eyes of the Lord. If you wished to acquire further knowledge, you had to learn through experience. 